Hello there, everyone, and welcome to this Friday edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com, coming to you all this week from New York City. It's Friday. It's been a fantastic week here in uh, New York. I've uh, had some uh, great meals with some uh, Stock Charts contributors and frequent guests. I've reconnected with some uh, mentors and had a lot of really good uh, conversations. Also enjoyed myself here and there uh, in the New York uh, area on Broadway and elsewhere. Today, what we're going to do is do a special all-mailbag edition, really focusing on some of the great questions you guys have been asking recently. As a reminder, one of the great parts of this show, I hope, is the ability to ask questions, and uh, we get to as many as we can on our mailbag uh, editions, but had some really thoughtful questions about a lot of different topics here in the last uh, week or two, so we're going to hit seven or eight of those uh, here in today's episode. So with that in mind, let's get to question number one. Dave, NVIDIA, NVDA had a shooting star candle pattern on March 4th. And then a bearish engulfing pattern on March 8th. Why is one more important than the other? Now, I'm paraphrasing your question. You actually, your question was more like, why'd you talk so much about the bearish engulfing pattern and not talk so much about the shooting star candle that happened uh, a little bit, a uh, little bit earlier? Let me just show you kind of what, um, what we're talking about here. So here's the candle chart of NVIDIA. And, you know, I love, uh, again, I love on uh, one of the g- recent upgrades we've made on uh, stock charts are these little uh, quick buttons that allow you to go to different chart styles. Uh, now we allow you to color code them and put a little two letter uh, code on that. It's such a like a minor tweak, but it has made such a difference for me just in terms of how I'm jumping between time frames and jumping between chart styles. So I'm really enjoying that new upgrade. If you haven't, haven't set that up, make sure you right click on one of your uh, buttons and you can start to customize uh, some of those things. But here's the candle chart of NVIDIA that we're talking about. And I think you're talking about this candle right here, which is on March 4th, which is a Monday as a shooting star candle. And that's when you have the open and close near the lower end of the day, limited uh, lower shadow, long upper shadow. And then you're talking about the bearish engulfing pattern, which is a two bar pattern Thursday into Friday. So you have an up day and a down day. Day two's body engulfs day one's body, right? So the open to close range on day two is wider than day one. And that's a bearish engulfing pattern. So you know, the short answer, I, w- I would say a couple of things. Number one, boy, if I had a team of junior analysts here at Stock Charts who were looking for patterns and giving me ideas of what to write about, they probably would have caught this one, maybe. Um, it's just me in a lot of ways kind of coming up with what to talk about. And, and a lot of the, you know, pretty much most of what I talk about on the show comes from my own conversations, my own analysis every day and every week, kind of going through the charts and seeing what stands out to me. And so that's number one. I, you know, I'm I limited, limited uh, capabilities to find anything and everything. So I appreciate you pointing this out. The other thing I would say, to be honest, probably why it didn't jump out to me as much is I think what you'll find with candle patterns is the same thing as you'd find with, um, you know, really any sort of technical analysis, right? You kind of have your go-to things that you like to follow, sort of your standard, you know, things that just are your are your main indicators. So for me, it's like RSI and relative strength and moving averages. Like every chart I look at probably has some combination of those. Something like candle patterns, there are hundreds of candle patterns out there, but I really only pay attention to like three or four of them. So there's a pattern called Three White Knights and three black crows. I can't tell you. I've, I mean, honestly, I've never really paid attention to those besides studying for the CMT exams where you had to know all of those patterns cold. Other than that, I, I don't pay attention to them. Engulfing patterns to me, I have found work really, really well, especially in a big uptrend. When you see one of these, it almost jumps off the page. It's hard to not recognize that. And the same with a bullish engulfing pattern that would happen after a downtrend. You get a big down day and then an up day where the second day engulfs the first day. For me, these are probably the most important patterns. If I was prioritizing all of the candles, those are probably the most important ones. Um, so those are the ones that I, uh, I would look for. So that, that's kind of the re- reason why I find that to be much more uh, helpful. And, and the other thing, I, I mean, I find shooting stars and hanging mans and uh, dojis and others, I mean, they're interesting, but they're not sort of my go-to. I mean, I, when I see a doji candle, that's not like a big game changer for me. When I see an engulfing pattern, it happens a lot less more com- a lot, lot less common and I think is uh, is more meaningful. And by the way, if you're trying to learn some of those patterns, two things I would do. Number one, go to Chart School, which is a free part of our website uh, where we basically show you graphically all the different chart patterns. That's from uh, John Murphy years ago, and I think it's really well done. The other thing is you can use our, uh, where is it, predefined scans right here. 
and we actually capture a bunch of candle patterns. So if you're looking for examples of bullish engulfing patterns or bearish engulfing patterns, just click on those numbers for the exchange you're looking at, and that'll give you some, uh, some things to uh, pay attention to. Great question, by the way, and thank you for that. Question number two, are you still short the QQQ? Why or why not? And uh, uh, I appreciate that question so much. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, I had mentioned on the on the air probably at some point that I was I had two inverse ETFs that I was uh, trading. The one was uh, SQQQ, which I actually do still hold, um, full disclosure. Um, and, you know, it's funny, I don't mention disclosure a lot on the show because I don't hold a lot of individual stocks, very, very few actually, Berkshire and a couple others, but I mean, they're more long-term like Disney, they're long-term holding. So I try to remember when I bring them up, but it's so, they're so infrequent that I don't really need to cover it too deeply, I think. Um, and I'm not an active trader, right? I, I don't, I don't trade that much during the day. I'm more of a, of a strategist. So I, 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 I try to keep more medium term, long term positions, but I did take some tactical positions in SQQQ, which I do, do still hold. And, and for me, that is a play on. All the concerning patterns that I'm starting to see, the webcast I'm doing on Tuesday of next week is the bull, the market top checklist. And I think it's because we've already seen the first item on the checklist pop up. Uh, and so we're going to talk about the other six items. Uh, and, and so I, I still think that's a decent one. I did close this one, which is the short um, semiconductor ETF. I'm kicking myself a little bit because, of course, right after I sold it, it popped up a little bit. I sold that at the, uh, I think earlier this week, maybe the end of next last week. I forget what day it was. Um, so I do still have uh, one of those uh, full disclosure, a short QQQ. Again, this is a tactical play for me. And, you know, for me, I, you know, when I take a, a tactical position like that, it's often, you know, I think with any position you're taking, the question should be, what's your goal? Like, what are you trying to do? For me, I have a, a, a strong feeling that we're in a corrective move, even though we've just started to see the beginnings of that. I think the mega cap growth trade is probably going to be on ice a little bit more than we've seen so far. And I think you're maybe seeing some of that uh, again today with the NASDAQ pushing lower. Um, so taking a trade like this just keeps it top of mind for me. And I learned that from portfolio managers at Fidelity when they would have these big core positions, but they randomly have some small name in there. And I'm like, what, what is that for? And it's like, I just really, that's an important theme for me. I'm not, I'm not ready to go all in. I'm not ready to bet the house on it, but I just want to understand how that evolves. And so that's sort of a speculative sort of test the waters kind of uh, position. And for me, just keeping it uh, top of mind. By the way, shout out Lou from Westlake. Thanks for uh, writing that question. And that's not far from where I grew up in Bay Village, Ohio. You asked for my favorite dish at Bay Diner. I've actually never been there, but I know that's in uh, Dover Junction. And uh, there was a Chinese restaurant there years ago called Bamboo House, which I remember going to all the time. Um, place I missed in Westlake, by the way, Cabin Club on Detroit Road. What a cool, uh, what a cool spot. We used to live right down the street from there. So um, very much enjoy. But thanks for watching from uh, Westlake, Ohio. Next question for your excellent and thanks for that market trend model. How would you optimize the settings for a different index or time frame like the QQQ instead of the SPY? or uh, daily instead of weekly. So in terms of the last part of your question, uh, and I'll bring up the chart here, um, I actually have a chart style called the market trend model, um, just to apply that same model to a bunch of other tickers. Now, uh, on the show, and the main chart I refer to is the SPY market trend model. And that's really the main market trend model. These other ones are just using that same framework of weekly moving averages to come up with different, uh, different signals. It's interesting that if the end of the week was right now, the QQQ would actually turn negative on the short term, which is interesting. I hadn't noticed that until uh, I was uh, prepping for the show today. Um, but that would be the first time that that uh, short term model has been negative since uh, the last week of the year. That was when we had this little pullback here before we resumed the uptrend. Um, so, you know, pullbacks in, in the way that I use this model, right? Pullback, like brief pullbacks that tend to be very viable. viable. The short term model turns negative. The weekly, the um, medium term and long term model stay, stay bullish. Um, more of a deeper correction, the short term model has already turned negative. But then the medium term model starts to turn negative. And that often means we're in a deterioration point. Look for the medium term model to go back positive, And that usually tells you the correction is over. The long term model turning negative is sort of your main risk off, like get out of the way. Uh, and the only signal we've had in the last five years was in March of 2022, basically saying, watch out, there's more downside to, uh, to come. So at this point, the short term model turning negative, I think of it as a pullback until we get further confirmation from other indicators that would tell me or, or if that short term model remains negative, that sort of further validates 
the fact that we're in a pullback. So in terms of daily or weekly, this is all driven by weekly data. I don't run a version of this using daily data because for me, the short term is really thinking about a couple of days to a couple of weeks. And that, that's as short as I like to play uh, stocks. If I was more of a day trader or a swing trader, I probably would use daily data and use shorter term versions of this, but not anything. This was meant to be more of a market trend model for the timeframes I'm trying to, uh, to understand. Uh, in terms of changing the settings, I don't. For the Qs, for gold, for Bitcoin, I use the same settings. Something to think about, right? For something like cryptocurrencies, would it make sense to uh, adjust those a little bit? I haven't found a need to uh, to do so, and it's been uh, th this particular model has uh, has has done very well. And what encourages me about this, this combination of different moving averages. Um, a number of different providers. I know uh, Ned Davis, they had a version of this called the Big Mo model and uh, other providers as well that I've uh, that I followed over time. So I think this general idea of trend following using exponential moving averages on weekly data is a well-trodden path of market strategists past. So uh, that's why I pay attention, uh, attention to it. I'll try to remember to put a link to this uh, chart, by the way, in the description. And you're welcome to apply this model to whatever tickers you're uh, interested in. Next question. For how long are signals for RSI or MACD continuously valid, assuming standard period lengths? That's a really interesting question. Um, and let me bring up, um, so you asked like MACD or RSI. So I have RSI on most of my charts and I'll bring in uh, MACD. And MACD and PPO, as you probably know, are, are pretty similar. In your question, you suggested using standard period lengths. So 14 day RSI, the MACD with these particular settings. You know, these settings actually come from the originators, the people that designed this, like Wells Wilder. You know, he created RSI. He, he did a bunch of testing and found that a 14-day look-back period worked really well for the stuff he was looking at. That's why it's the default. I wouldn't be afraid to change those. I would just encourage you to stay consistent. I think trying to optimize for every ticker is a little curve fitting that's a little over aggressive with your customization. But finding a good time frame for RSI that connects with the way that you trade, I think is very interesting. By the way, as we're bringing this up, I'm one of the um, the first item on that bear market top or that, that uh, market top checklist, bearish momentum divergences and seeing a bunch of them. And, and IBM is not the only one making higher highs January, February, March and lower momentum through that period. That is that is the, the first item on my uh, watch out market top uh, checklist. And again, go to marketmisbehavior.com slash checklist to sign up for that free event coming up on uh, Tuesday of next week on March 19th. But your question was looking at MACD and RSI. I, so generally speaking, I would say the further to the left you go on whatever time frame you're looking at, the less and less relevant, right? Recent signals tell you the most about the current data. The further you go to the left, you know, does a, a, a MACD signal back here have any particular meaning? Um, I don't think so. I mean, besides the fact that it's a great example of where the indicator was pretty good at identifying a top. And I mean, look at, again, when you, what's great about technical analysis is you can look back. And uh, one of my former analysts at Fidelity, Mark Dibble, used to say, charts are your report card for, for your uh, process. And I think that's right. I mean, higher highs in price, November, December of 22, lower peaks in momentum. That's a bearish divergence. The MACD signal uh, there in late November, all of that around Thanksgiving of last year, early December was telling you this thing's topping out. And examples like that, that just validate why these indicators are helpful. I think that's really, it's really helpful to look to the left and just see what sort of signals we've gotten on a particular stock. But, you know, how relevant is a signal back here? I would say not particularly, right? So in general, the start at the final bar, that's one of the reasons why this show is called what it is. You start at the right, you read from right to left. So you don't read like you would in English left to right, which is how a lot of novice analysts tend to do it. You want to read a chart from right to left. So more like you would in Hebrew or in Arabic or one of those languages that actually reads in reverse, uh, right to left. You want to start at the current data and go back. And I would say the further left you get, Support and resistance levels, moving average signals, uh, any indicator signals become less and less relevant. Now, how relevant? I don't know if there's a particular time frame. I think that depends a lot on the chart you're looking at and your outlook. It depends more on your uh, on your on your forward looking outlook, on your investment horizon, as opposed to the data you're bringing in. But further to the left, the less relevant for sure. Next question: Someone on Twitter, now called X, of course, showed oh boy, a bunch of tickers divided by a bunch of other tickers. So it's uh, as a master risk on off chart. What do you think? So what they're basically doing there is looking at some defensive sectors like healthcare, staples, and utilities, uh, really more value sectors versus leader growth sectors like uh, consumer discretionary, semiconductors, technology. They're actually double counting um, semiconductors and technology. 
That's an interesting one. I mean, you know what? So here's the thing. Short answer is no, that is not something you can do on stock charts yet, which is basically apply a bunch of tickers like say XLY plus XLP plus XLC um, divided by something else. That is something our, it's on our development queue. I hope we can get to it because it would be great to be able to do fun things like that. Um, do we have that capability? No. But I would say that is a very complicated and um calculation intensive way of getting to this particular chart, which is growth uh, value over growth, right? You have four value ETFs versus four growth ETFs. And uh, for the person that uh, actually is from longtime viewer, Peter, um, thanks for sending this in. If you look at the chart that you sent me and you included an image in your question, look at this chart of the IWD divided by the IWF. They're almost identical. And I find that a lot of times when I mean, you think Coming up with these great combinations of things is going to give you some additional color. I would say you've basically done value divided by growth. You've just come up with a more computationally challenging way of getting to this easy, you know, this easy ratio of two ETFs that are pretty common. Um, and, and the point of the, the tweet that you shared was, I think, just the fact that this ratio has gotten back down to the 2021 and 2020 lows. And I think that's absolutely right. I think that's a fair way of recognizing that uh, growth has been outperforming value uh, in a big way for the last 12 months. And potentially we're at the bottom of that, right? And we're maybe at the end of that and, and the beginning. This little uptick is the beginning of value starting to be a much stronger performer. I would 100% agree with that. I don't know if that's a master risk on off chart. I would say that is definitely a reason to be into value sectors versus growth sectors, which I think is a decent approach right about now in March of 2024. Um, so I don't know about risk on, risk off, but definitely growth versus value. That is a, a, a great way of showing it. I, I would say this is a, a an easy way of, uh, of, of showing uh, what they were showing in that tweet. Thanks, Peter, for that question, by the way. Next one, what's the best way to scan for strong relative performers? And I'm summarizing a much larger question, and thanks for sending this in. And you included some syntax that I've copied into the scan engine. You actually showed these two lines right here. You said, now we have two different ways to scan for relative strength. I'm going to make both of these uh, active just so you can see it. So what's the difference between the, the rest of this, by the way, the rest of this up until there is just... Um, this is just kind of filtering the universe down to a certain market cap and you know all of that. So ignore that. Just get to these last two lines here. So um, this was the one that we've had for a long time. This this line seven we actually just recently added here. Um, but line eight is the one where it's basically the relative percent. So it's basically the relative performance over the last twenty days versus the SPY is greater than zero, right? So look at the return on an individual stock over the last 20 days. Look at the return of the S&P. Is the return on the stock greater than the S&P? Then, it, then, it, then it's a thumbs up and it would come up on your screen. That's what you're doing with that line there. This line is a new feature we just added, which is an indicator called price relative. And the way that you do this is you add an argument that has what you're doing it relative to. And I would usually use the SPY unless you have a, another reason. And then greater than yesterday's maximum... Uh, of uh, price relative. So basically the relative strength line, which is kind of uh, this line, whoops, this line down here at the bottom, this is IBM versus the S&P. So I'm basically saying, look at this line and I want to make sure that right now we're the highest we've been versus the last four weeks or the last 20 days, basically a trading month. So why would you use one versus the other? So what you have to remember is um, they're similar, but actually quite different if you think of the math of this. This line number seven is basically saying this relative performance line is the highest it's been. So this would fit the criteria. This one right here would not, right? Uh, because it's not the highest it's been in the last 20. So if I ran the screen today, IBM would not come up because we are below the highest point that we've been uh, over the last month, which was like a week ago, right? So, so that, that would not uh, appear. But if I was scanning for this one, line eight, which is uh, for the last 20 days, this stock has outperformed the S&P. You know, so right now versus 20 days ago, it's it's two points in time. Um, it actually would come back on the screen because today is higher than it was uh, 20 days ago. So it actually would be a thumbs up. So two different ways to think about it. The one would be, you know, just is it up? And so it, IBM could like have outperformed dramatically and then come way down. But as long as right now is higher than 20 days ago, 
it would actually uh, return a positive for that uh, item, but it would not work for this because this means it has to be the highest it's been. So this one is a little more specific. This would be a little tougher of a criteria to satisfy. As a result, you'll probably get a lot less names, but you will have names that have been more consistent outperformers or at least are in a strong moment right now as you run the screen. Um, so that's how I would think of it. I do versions of the screen using weekly data, and it's actually been really helpful. So scanning for stocks that are making a new, you know, three-month relative high versus other uh, stocks uh, can be a helpful uh, thing. So I hope that makes sense in terms of these two different arguments. These are all things you can find down here, um, you know, so price relative, percent change, percent relative. These are all different indicators here. And if you have no idea how to use one of these, the um, uh, the the uh, it'll automatically pop up with some instructions. You can also click on a little magnifying glass, type the uh, the particular argument you're looking for, and uh, and also hit a, hit our support desk if you're running into trouble using the scanning engine for sure. Next question, where are we at? What are your views on hourly charts versus 65-minute charts versus 39-minute charts? I love that question. All right, let's look at, uh, I don't mean to be IBM uh, centric here. Let's go to Apple and I'll bring up like an hourly chart here. So when you're looking at intraday data, there's this issue you have, okay? So if I look at a 60 minute or an hourly chart, the trading day in the US is not divided into even 60 minute sessions, right? The trading out, the trading day is actually six and a half hours, right? So, um, so, so if you split the market uh, day into uh, half hour, uh, 60 minute segments, you're going to have six candles that are 60 minutes, and then you're going to have a little 30 minute candle at the end of the day. Um, and that's just because it's not an even, it's not evenly divided into 60 minutes. So um, the way that people make, you know, some people don't like the fact that you have hourly candles, but one of the candles is actually a 30 minute candle. That's that's kind of the convention in the charting world, to be honest, having used a lot of different platforms. That's kind of what most people do. So how do you fix that if you really don't like that? Well, you have to use uh, numbers that are evenly dividable, right, uh, within the trading day. So if you click on this little drop down on ACP, you have a same drop down at the top. You'll see we've added some of these evenly divided ones, right? So if you use 65 minute candles, that gives you six even bars a day. If you do 39 minutes, it's 10 even bars a day. 30 minutes would work fine, right? Because that's what, 12, 13 even bars every uh, every trading day. Something like 60 minutes uh, or 120 minutes doesn't actually divide well. So you have to have a candle that has or a bar that has less than the, the number just to sort of finish up the day and, uh, and, and respect the daily close because there's always a gap there. Um, I'm not, I mean, I don't use enough intraday charts to have a strong feeling on this. I, I would say, you know, for me, daily and weekly makes sense, right? Quarterly makes sense. Yearly makes sense because the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of a quarter, the end of the year have meaning, right? So at Friday's close to Monday's open, those are two very different things, right? So having a weekly chart that goes Friday to Friday, meaningful, you know, a you know 15 minute chart thinking that the close of one 15 minute period, right? You know, 10, 15 a.m. to 10, 16 a.m. is this big change. Like it isn't. It's just a moment in time and you're just doing it to evenly, you know, to sort of get, you know, intraday data. I don't think there's a good reason why a particular time frame has meaning. I think for daily, weekly, for quarterly, for yearly charts, it makes sense because the end of a day, the end of a week, the end of a quarter, the end of a year, those are like a moment in time which has significance for us as humans. I could argue that there might be some changes in investor sentiment from one close to the next open using those time periods. Five minute bars really don't matter in terms of one bar to the next. It's not like there's a big change or we all go home or take a break or have breakfast. It's just kind of like it's just a moment in time and taking a snapshot. So I don't really have a strong conviction on any of these. I think whichever bar or candle setting intraday that's going to help you answer the questions you were trying to answer during that time period that's the right answer for you. For me, I use hourly charts uh, because I'm not trading off of them. It's just more to understand that short-term time frame. So hourly for me makes a ton of sense. And then I have a five-minute chart that I use as well. If I'm really trying to think about, you know, moment to moment, how is something happening? Is something opening strong or opening weak? You know, what's happening after the first 30 minutes, what's happening in the last hour, the, the five-minute chart is the lowest I tend to go um, just to get a good picture of, uh, of the intraday sentiment and how that might be changing. 
Uh, but that's, uh, by the way, the way that you change those time frames at the top of sharp charts and the top of ACP as well. You have a drop down and we have those evenly dividable um, uh, numbers at the bottom. Hopefully that helps you make sense about why and when you might want to use it. To me, it's funny. I, I think of it a lot as like, you know, coming up with the logic for like a 39 minute candle. It's like trying to come up with the logic for the imperial system of measurements versus the metrics. Like it doesn't make sense, right? Having things evenly divided in tens and one hundreds makes a lot of sense. Having things divided in 39 minutes, I, there's no, there's no logical justification for that other than it, it, you know, it's, it's easy and it works. Uh, final question here for the episode. Are there any signs to be drawn from a chart when looking at a risk of bankruptcy? And this was the ticker you asked about in particular, uh, FSR Fisker Inc. I don't know this name, um, by the way. It's a uh, what well, small small cap name, less than 100 million. It's like a micro cap name, um, FSR. So I, I don't really have a, a perspective to share on the company and what's happening. Uh, but this does remind me, you're basically, what do, you, what do you do with the chart of this? It's gone from you know a normal range of a stock down to a penny stock, right? And and uh, it's still on the NYSE, but I can't imagine for long, given what's happening, these are the types of names that get delisted very quickly. So what do you do from a technical perspective? You know, it's so funny. I, I, again, I don't know the conditions about what's happening. If there's a speculation of bankruptcy, or obviously there's some some serious issue going on with this company. Um, I, I mentioned uh, my, my analyst team at Fidelity, which I miss those guys uh, so much. I mean, just really thoughtful, knowledgeable analysts. I miss having a group of technical analysts to, to uh, chat with every day uh, in the building. Uh, but one of the things that we would uh, that one of them would would love to share in a presentation was that, you know, here's how a fundamental analyst, you know, um, addresses, you know, thinks about risk of bankruptcy. And it went through like this whole page of text of different models and different specifics and what's happening and like thinking about all these different data points and the odds of things. And it was like, here's how a technical analyst assesses the risk of bankruptcy. And it's this big breakdown below a clear support level. And it just starts going down and stops going up. It's like at this point, from a technical perspective, the stock is a bad stock or the chart is certainly a bad chart and you want to get out of the way. And the reasons why it's such a bad chart become obvious like way down here. Once it's already lost all of its value, that's when a quarterly filing or a news event says, hey, here's what's actually going on with the company. It's a lot of speculation up until that point. Um, so I think, again, charts are a great risk management tool in, in that the chart tells you when to get out of the way. And it t- signals it back here when we're below downward sloping moving averages. How many times have we talked about, you know, nothing good happens below the 200 day moving average? So, we're, you know, staying away from those kind of names means you don't participate in this move at all. What happens when things are making new 52 week lows? It's usually not a good thing. You know, some people think of that as like a ripe opportunity for buying. This is literally the falling knife example you might want to have in your back pocket. This is why you stay away from from charts that are kind of going down and making lower lows and lower highs. Um, so at this point, what do you do with it? I would say very, very little, right? I mean, at this point, you're you're down in, you know, and, and honestly, when stocks get below $5 a share, you have to remember that most institutions have to stay away from it. A lot of institutional investors have a mandate that, that says they can't get into names uh, below $5 a share. So once things break that magical floor, there's just a lot less potential upside impact, right? Because there are less institutions that are going to want to take a shot at something like this. It's just it's trading at too small of a price. And if you're running a decent sized fund, you can't even accumulate a meaningful position in this to make it even move the needle on your funds. It's like you have to just it's not even worth looking at. Um, so as a result, it's it, there is a much less likelihood that it's actually going to recover at all at this point. Looking for stocks in clear downtrends and staying away from things that are breaking below $5 a share. Those are the types of things I would look for in a portfolio, right? This is how I would use the scan engine and say, look at this chart list. Have a portfolio of yours in a chart list and say, scan this chart list and, and have a scheduled scan every week, right? Set up a chart. And I'll show you what I mean. You set up a chart list um, here. And you put a chart list and just copy and paste from your brokerage platform. If you don't know what you're doing, um, say... Uh, test one, two, three. And then here you can literally copy and paste um, from a, um, uh, you know, from a CSV file, from a, you know, text, wherever, just get the tickers in here, say, create new list. And then once you have uh, the list up here and I'll do, let's do like this one, Dow Industries, what you can then do is you can actually, uh, so let's say this is your, not, not this one, let's say this um, you know, Dow stocks. This is your portfolio, just a, 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 um, a fake portfolio here. Then what you want to do is go to scans and go to scheduled scans and basically pick one of your scans like stocks making new three month lows 
And, um, and by the way, make sure in your scan you specify, look at this particular chart list, and then you can have it say, all right, scan every Friday and tell me if any of the stocks that are in my portfolio, tell me if any of them have broken to a new three-month low. And that should be the list you absolutely uh, take action on, right? You focus on it. Say, okay, here's my danger list. Have a scheduled scan every day that's like your warning list. Um, it says, hey, tell me if any of these names that I'm holding, uh, tell me that uh, you know if any of them are breaking down or any of them are giving a sell signal based on MACD or whatever signal is going to help you stay out of those names where the chart is going down in an aggressive way. Run a scan that does that on your chart list and then schedule that and have stock charts do some work for you and tell you when things might be uh, breaking down. At the very least, things you need to uh, revisit. That's it for the week. And thank you again, uh, everyone, so much for hanging with us uh, this week as we do this show remotely from New York. Hopefully, we'll be traveling home safely Sunday morning and uh, should be back in the studio to do the show as normal from Redmond, Washington on uh, Monday. But it's been a lot of fun being in uh, New York City here. And uh, appreciate your uh, being patient with us as we get things going for Stock Charts in Redmond, Washington this week from New York. I'm Dave Keller. Be well. Stay safe. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you next week.